Hey guys, welcome to Spec Transfer. So today we'll be talking about topics 3.1.3 lipids and 3.1.4 proteins from the AQA A-level biology specification. Let's have a quick look at the specification. We'll be giving you a general overview of triglycerides and phospholipids, also the formation of triglycerides, and then also how the structure of triglycerides and phospholipids relates to their functions. And finally, the emulsion test for lipids. Triglycerides and phospholipids are two groups of lipid. Lipids contain the elements carbon, hydrogen and oxygen, and sometimes phosphorus and sometimes nitrogen. So let's start off with triglycerides, which mainly act as energy stores in plants and animals. They are formed by the condensation of one molecule of glycerol and three molecules of fatty acid. Here I've drawn you a diagram to just illustrate this. So we have glycerol, which has the alcohol functional group here, which reacts with one fatty acid. This is a condensation reaction, so the OH group from the carboxylic acid group of the fatty acid is lost, and the hydrogen atom of the alcohol group of the glycerol. This forms an ester link between the fatty acid and the glycerol to form a triglyceride. So triglycerides are esters. So just to summarise that point, fatty acids have the general formula RCOOH, having a carboxylic acid group, so are carboxylic acids. Glycerol is an alcohol with an alcohol functional group, and as we know from chemistry, alcohols and carboxylic acids react to form esters, so triglycerides are esters. Note that the hydrocarbon tails of fatty acids are hydrophobic, making lipids insoluble in water. Fatty acids can be classified as saturated or unsaturated. All fatty acids have an R group that varies, and it is this R group which determines if a fatty acid is saturated or unsaturated. Saturated means that the fatty acid contains no CC double carbon bonds. Unsaturated means that there is at least one CC double carbon bond present, which forms a kink in the chain. Next we have phospholipids, which have the same structure as triglycerides, except that one fatty acid has been replaced by a phosphate group. The phosphate group is hydrophilic, hydro coming from the Greek for water and philic loving. So the phosphate group forms a hydrophilic region. And again, we still have the hydrophobic fatty acid hydrocarbon tails. So now that we've given a general overview of triglycerides and phospholipids, as well as their structures, we need to relate these structures to their various functions. Let's start off with triglycerides, which mainly act as energy storage molecules. They are insoluble, so they don't affect water potential, which may cause water to move into or out of cells by osmosis, which could cause cells to swell, burst or shrink. They also have a high ratio of energy storing C to H bonds to carbon atoms and are therefore excellent sources of energy. They have a low mass to energy ratio, meaning that they are good storage molecules as lots of energy can be stored in a small volume. Finally, they have a high ratio of H to O atoms, meaning that they release water when oxidized and therefore provide an important source of water, especially for organisms living in dry deserts. In an aqueous environment, they clump together as their hydrophobic fatty acid hydrocarbon tails point inward and they are shielded from the water by their glycerol heads. Next, we have phospholipids, which make up the bilayer of cell membranes, including membranes of organelles in eukaryotes. This controls what can enter and leave a cell or organelle. Phospholipids are polar molecules with hydrophilic and hydrophobic regions, meaning that they form a bilayer in an aqueous environment, as they do in cell membranes. This forms a hydrophobic barrier at the centre of the bilayer, which prevents water-soluble substances from passing through. Their phospholipid structure allows them to form glycolipids by combining with carbohydrates within the cell surface membrane. Glycolipids are important in cell recognition. Here we have a diagram of the phospholipid bilayer. We would have aqueous environments here and here. So finally, we just need to look at the emulsion test for lipids. To test for lipids, simply shake some of the sample with 4 cm cubed of ethanol. Filter the liquid into a test tube of water, leaving any solids behind. 
If lipid is present, this will precipitate in the water, forming a cloudy white emulsion. And take note of the wording very carefully here, because if you write something like milky, this sometimes isn't accepted in the mark schemes of exams. So great, now we've completed lipids 3.1.3. Next, we'll move on to proteins, which will include the general structure of amino acids, the formation of dipeptides and polypeptides, as well as the structure of proteins, and finally, the Burette test for proteins. Proteins are made of amino acid monomers. Amino acids contain the elements carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, and sometimes sulfur. Their general structure, we have an amine group, NH2, a carboxyl group, COOH, and an R group. The 20 amino acids that are common in all living organisms differ only in their variable psi group, the R group. Dipeptides are formed by the condensation of two amino acids, whereas polypeptides, poly meaning many, are formed by the condensation of many amino acids. The bonds formed between the amino acid monomers are called peptide bonds. So let's have a look at this on a diagram. The carboxylic acid group loses an OH, the amine group loses an H atom. These combine to form H2O, water, therefore it's a condensation reaction, and the amino acids join to form a peptide bond which consists of CONH. Note that in digestion, the reverse of this reaction happens. It is a hydrolysis reaction and involves the use of a molecule of water to split these two into two individual amino acids. Next, we'll have a look at protein structure, which consists of primary, secondary, tertiary, and sometimes quaternary structures. The primary structure is the sequence of amino acids. The secondary structure is when hydrogen bonds form between the amino acids in the chain, causing the chain to fold either into a beta pleated sheet or to coil into an alpha helix. Note that where hydrogen bonds are formed depends on the amino acid sequence as well as the R group. It is this which determines if an alpha helix or a beta pleated sheet is formed. A fully functioning polypeptide is made up of a combination of these so-called domains, where each domain is either a section of alpha helix or beta pleated sheet. Next we have the tertiary structure, which is the 3D folding of the polypeptide chain in a precise way as determined by the amino acids of which it is composed. Three different types of bonds determine the tertiary structure. Hydrogen bonds, which are weak attractions between delta positive and delta negative R groups. Ionic bonds, which are bonds between fully positive and fully negative R groups. As well as disulfide bridges, which are covalent bonds between two sulfur containing R groups. As we go down here, as represented by the arrow, the bonds have increasing strength. So disulfide bridges are the strongest types of bonds which determine the tertiary structure of proteins. Some proteins also have a quaternary structure, which is a number of polypeptide chains linked together and sometimes associated with non-protein groups to form a protein. Note that a fully functioning protein may be made of just one polypeptide, so it doesn't have a quaternary structure, which is why I've put this in brackets. So back to our specification, we've looked at the structure of amino acids as well as the formation of dipeptides and polypeptides, and also the structure of proteins. So next we just need to have a look at the Burette test for proteins. To test for proteins, simply add a few drops of Burette solution. If protein is present, a blue ring will form at the surface of the solution, which disappears upon shaking and the solution turns lilac purple. Note that the Burette test can be also used for enzymes, as enzymes are proteins. Now that we've looked at the general properties of proteins, we can move on to enzymes. Enzymes are proteins that act as biological catalysts. This means that they speed up chemical reactions by providing an alternative reaction pathway of lower activation energy, but they are not used up in the reaction itself. Enzymes hereby reduce the activation energy required for the reaction, which increases the rate of the reaction. 
So just a quick definition. Activation energy is the energy required for a reaction to happen. In all reactions, bonds are broken in the reactants and formed to give us the products. Energy needs to be put in to break the bonds of the reactants at the start of the reaction, and this energy is the activation energy. The lower the activation energy, the easier it is for a reaction to happen, and therefore the faster the rate of the reaction. As you can see in this energy profile diagram, there is a lower activation energy in the reaction with the enzyme. Therefore, we have a faster rate of reaction. So how do enzymes lower the activation energy? This is explained by the lock and key model at GCSE, as well as the induced fit theory, which is an expansion of the lock and key model at A level. So just a quick recap of the lock and key theory at GCSE. The tertiary structure of the enzyme is such that the shape of the enzyme's active site is complementary to that of the substrate. So the substrate can fit into the enzyme's active site to form an enzyme substrate complex. At A level, we have to learn the induced fit theory, which is in order to completely form an enzyme substrate complex, the enzyme and substrate have to alter their shape slightly. This weakens specific bonds in the substrate needing to be broken, which lowers the activation energy required for the reaction to happen, increasing the rate of reaction. Next, we'll have a look at the effect of a few factors upon the rate of enzyme controlled reactions. First of all, temperature. At A, as the temperature increases, the rate of reaction increases. This is because enzyme and substrate molecules have more kinetic energy, and so the frequency of collisions between these molecules increases, so more enzyme substrate complexes are formed per minute. However, after the optimum temperature, at B, the rate begins to decrease. This is because the rise in temperature causes hydrogen and ionic bonds which hold the enzyme's tertiary structure in place to break, altering the tertiary structure of the enzyme, changing the shape of the active site too, so that it is no longer complementary to that of the substrate. The enzyme is said to be denatured. In an exam, say that there is a change in the tertiary structure of the enzyme, causing a change in the shape of the active site too. Second, we have pH. And here we have a number of curves for different enzymes. As you can see, different enzymes have different optimum pHs. For example, salivary amylase has an optimum pH of 7 as it's secreted in the mouth. Pancreatic amylase has an optimum pH of 2 because it's secreted in acidic conditions. As you move away from the optimum pH, the shape of the active site changes and will denature beyond a certain extreme pH. This is because the change in concentration of H plus and OH minus ions interferes with hydrogen and ionic bonds which hold the enzyme's tertiary structure in place. Next we have enzyme concentration. At A, the more enzymes there are in a solution, the more likely a substrate molecule is to collide with one to form an enzyme substrate complex, so at first enzyme concentration is directly proportional to the rate of reaction. However, at B, the amount of substrate becomes limiting, so increasing the enzyme concentration has no further effect, so the rate levels off and remains constant. Note, however, that in real life this would never happen in the body, as enzymes are released subject to the concentration of substrate. Next we have substrate concentration, which shows the same trend as enzyme concentration. At A, the more substrate there is in a solution, the more likely an enzyme is to collide with one and form an enzyme substrate complex. Therefore, substrate concentration at A is directly proportional to the rate of reaction. At B, however, the amount of enzymes becomes limiting, and therefore increasing the substrate concentration will have no further effect, so the rate of reaction levels off and remains constant. Finally, we'll take a look at enzyme inhibition. There are two types of inhibitors, competitive and non-competitive inhibitors. Competitive inhibitors are molecules that have a shape similar to that of the enzyme's normal substrate. They therefore can fit into the enzyme's active site to form an enzyme inhibitor complex. This prevents substrate molecules from binding to the active site. Competitive inhibitors compete with the substrate molecules for available active sites. The difference in concentrations of the inhibitor and of the substrate molecules determines how many enzymes are inhibited. 
Note that the higher the concentration of competitive inhibitors, the slower the rate of reaction because there is more competition for available active sites, so fewer enzyme substrate complexes are formed per minute. Next we have non-competitive inhibitors, which, unlike competitive inhibitors, work by binding to the enzyme in a place other than the active site. This changes the tertiary structure of the enzyme, altering the shape of the active site too, meaning that it is no longer complementary to that of the substrate. Substrate molecules can no longer therefore bind to the active site. Note that non-competitive inhibitors are often foreign to the body and toxic, such as cyanide. This is an irreversible reaction, the shape of the active site is forever changed. Substrate and inhibitor do not compete for the active site, so increasing the substrate concentration has no influence on the effect of the inhibitor. When comparing when no inhibitors are used with when competitive inhibitors are used and non-competitive inhibitors, competitive inhibitors will level off at the same rate of reaction as when no inhibitors are used, just it takes a higher substrate concentration to reach this point. With non-competitive inhibitors, increasing substrate concentration has no effect upon the enzyme activity. So that's it, we've covered everything from this part of the specification. Thank you for watching SpecTransfer. Next time we'll be looking at nucleic acids and ATP.